see. Okay, one of these days I was watching uh, the, the video, they call them uh, National, I think the, the, the company which shoots the video calls itself National Geographic, something, something. Uh, they are showing uh, the videos of wild animals. So one of the animals obviously they would actually show there is a lion which is obviously uh, tracking its prey. So what you usually see when a lion is tracking, let, let me use uh, the example of a buffalo, uh, it's not just going to go there and attack. Uh, of course it has to calculate its moves because if it doesn't calculate its moves, it's actually going to end up being the victim. But most of the time the lion is going to be the winner uh, because it so crafty in the way it does its things. So when it goes there, it sees the head of the buffalo, uh, which is grazing. So most of the time it goes there, and of course it's standing the, 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 the buffaloes, and one of the, 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 the bulls is actually going to come out of the head and is going to try and chase at this lion. To begin with, the lion is like a coward because he's going to run away. Uh, but as he's running away, of course, that motivates more that the bull of the buffalo is continues trying to chase. But by so doing, the bull has isolated itself from the head. So by the moment it gets a little bit far away from the head, other lions who obviously be hiding somewhere are uh, going to close uh, uh, the way and the bull can't come back. And the moment they come on him, I like, well I don't like it, in fact I don't, I hate uh, how animals animals kill them, kill each other, especially how the lion does. Perhaps the lion is a bit smarter. Uh, if you have watched the hyena uh, or the, the, the pack of wild dogs, they are so, so cruel that uh, an animal is going to be eaten alive. They are going to be taking a chunk of meat until uh, uh, the, the animal drops dead. So the lion, of, of course, is going to win. But of course, if the, the head is going to hear the cry uh, for help from their compatriots, then they go and help. Most of the time, they also are able to chase away the lion. But what I've always seen happening is that by the time they are chased away, the lion they were working on for the past 10 minutes or so, uh, the, I mean, the buffalo they would have been working on, uh, it's so injured that even momentarily uh, the head is going to win. Eventually, the injuries are going to get, you know, uh, they are going to get. Uh, uh, over uh, this other buffalo and eventually it's going to die or they are still going to come back again because they don't go away, they are always going to be lingering around. So the best thing for a buffalo to do is to avoid those injuries. But then how does, how do they, how can they, uh, you know, avoid the injuries? Of course by remaining as a team and you don't want to be so outstanding out of the team or to leave the team to isolate yourself because the moment you do that then you are in trouble. Why am I talking about wildlife? And why am I mentioning the lion in particular? Because the passage that we have just read is exactly doing the same. It's talking about the lion. But I want you to listen to what the Apostle Peter says. Peter, we have to know that he was one of the elders, I guess, for the church in Jerusalem at the time. So he is actually talking from the standpoint of being an elder. But over and above that, he's also talking from the standpoint of him being an apostle. These are, these are the people that have been uh, given all the powers. You remember in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, I've given you the powers. Because of that, go ye therefore and preach the gospel. So this is the man we have seen it all. He is writing perhaps towards the end of his life. He's, this is the man that has actually been there in the growing, I mean the growing uh, war that they have been fighting against uh, uh, their, their fellow Jews who didn't want them to be Christians. And I want you to listen to what he is saying. Even in verse 4, he says, and before verse 4, when he writes from verse 1, he says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. I am telling you, because I'm also an elder, I know the problems that we are going through. So I am telling you as a fellow elder. He says a few things thereafter, but he goes on in verse 3 and says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercise the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. But jump again with me to verse 4, and this is what he says. In verse 4, he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Of course, he is counting himself as the shepherd, but he knows that uh, he is just a shepherd who is limited. But the chief shepherd is Christ, who actually is going to come. 
Then he goes on and he now is addressing the fellow elders, but I guess he's also addressing fellow congregants and everybody else who cares to listen. And this is what he says, you have to humble yourself in verse 6. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties <coughs> on him, because he cares for you. But listen to what he says in verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Why are you supposed to be sober-minded? Why are you supposed to be watchful? If you think about being sober, you are actually talking about somebody whose mind is not black, whose eyes are not black by anything. You are still in your natural uh, you know, capacity to see things and to uh, think about things. So he wants you, he wants me to be sober-minded, but at the same time, you're also supposed to be watchful if you think about watching or being watchful. Of course, this would be the, the job that the security guards are supposed to do. Whenever you are employed as a security person, either at a firm or wherever you are, you are supposed to be watchful all the time. What it means is your eyes are supposed to be open every time because you are supposed to be seeing every transaction that is happening so that you are not, the company is not going to be uh, prejudiced of anything. You are not going to suffer loss at the end of the day. So he is saying to the Christian, be sober-minded and be watchful. But listen to the reason why he encourages us to be watchful and be sober. He says, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. I told you about the reason why I gave an example of a lion. Because if you have watched uh, those movies, you would know exactly how the lion attacks its, uh, its, uh, its prey. But what, what is so interesting is when it has attacked the prey, it makes sure that it wants the, 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 the prey to be suffocated to death. You are not my friend. You are meat. I want to eat you. So I should make sure that you are dead. And that's exactly what the lion is going to try and do. In no time, the, 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 the buffalo is dead. And of course, the lion is, is enjoying the meat. Why is Peter using the example of a lion? Because he exactly is envisioning what I'm talking about, where a lion is going to attack an animal and it's going to cruelly kill that animal. But he nevertheless says you should be sober, you should be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. But look at what he is looking for. He is seeking someone that he can devour. You know, if you check uh, 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 the, the word adversary, which is used here in Greek, of course, which is always the, the manual that we refer back to. And the word, the Greek word that is used there is called antidikos. And the word antidikos means a, an arch enemy. He is not just an enemy. But this is a sworn enemy. He's an arch enemy. So he is saying your adversary, or rather he's saying your arch enemy or your antidecos is the devil. And for sure we all understand that the devil is actually the enemy of Christians. In fact, the devil is always opposing whatever God would have said. So if people are moving with God, the devil is going to be their arch enemy. It's going to be the adversary. So we are supposed to be worried and we are supposed to be watchful for him. Why? Because the devil is prowling around, just like what the lion, the lion does. He is actually there all over. I mean, trying just to make sure he gets the opportunity. In fact, the book of Job uh, gives us a bit of an insight in how the, the devil operates. You may remember the story of Job in the Old Testament, of course, in Job chapter 1, reading the first, I mean, reading verse 6 and verse 7. Uh, perhaps it will help us understand clearer what the Apostle Peter is writing about here. What does the passage say there in the book of John? Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Listen to the devil's answer. Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and from on the earth, and from walking up and down on him. So the sa Satan is actually making uh, a reply which gives us an idea of how he operates. He walks up and down, to and from. He is not looking for anyone or anything in particular, but he is looking for any opportunity uh, to actually count one that is going to be left behind. So he is walking up and down uh, the earth so that he can see whoever is, can be the, the victim. In, this, in the story of Job, of course we know that God is going to allow the devil to test Job. Uh, all his children were killed. This morning I think we talked about how faithful Job was. His animals were also killed. And of course he lost his health in, in fact. And uh, we know that at some point his wife is even going to try and turn against him. But of course the Bible continues to tell us that even though Job inflicted all these things, I mean the Satan 
inflicted all these things on Job. Job was sober-minded. Job was watchful to the extent that, like in verse 22 of chapter 1, we are told that Job did not sin or he did not charge God with any wrongdoing. After having gone through uh, all the problems that he went through, Job did not sin or he did not charge God uh, with any wrong. So Apostle Peter is exactly reminding Christians, or he reminded Christians on the day, and he is still reminding Christians today to be one of Satan, who still is roaming uh, the earth up and down, seeking someone he can give up. This is the very Satan who was there uh, in the Garden of Eden, who tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell. And he's going to tempt several other men and women along the, 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 the whole history of the Bible until today. This is the same Satan that you and me are facing today. And this is the Satan that we are supposed to be sober-minded. Because if we are not sober-minded, if our judgment is going to be clouded by many, many things, then unfortunately we are going to fall uh, for the trap of the, of, of the devil. Of the devil. I like the use of the word devour. I mean, we have just loaded the word adversary. And now if we look at the word devour, I was checking the word devour in the English dictionary. And the word devour, uh, means to eat quickly or to eat greedily or someone who is eating hungry. So that's exactly what Peter is giving us this picture that when Satan comes and he grabs you, he is not going to be eating in a friendly manner. He is not going to kill you in a friendly fashion. In fact, you should make sure that you are dead. And once you are dead, you are going to be eaten very quickly such that there is not going to be any trace of you once he has gotten hold of you. He's going to eat greedy and he also eat hungry. There is no friendliness in the way a certain destroys. Yeah, he's, he's, he's praying. He is so harsh because he is not our friend. I mean, so for us to protect ourselves, we should not even let him uh, win against us because the moment he wins against us, then we are in trouble because he is not your friend. But the question is, who is likely uh, to fall victim to Satan? Peter is, of course, giving an, a, a warning. He's warning Christians. I guess we can also learn a lot of things from there. But is he talking about the generality of Christians, or there are some people that he is perhaps targeting that might fall victim uh, uh, to what he is talking about? I have a, a few uh, suggestions that I want to make to you this morning about those people that are going to fall victim to, to, to this devil when he comes. The first group of people that are going to fall victim, of course, uh, to certain are those who are lagging behind because they are likely to be, uh, to be devoured by certain. By that, what do I mean? We, we have become Christians already. And some of us, of course, there are some still among us who haven't become Christians. And I have to reiterate the fact that you can only become a Christian after you have uh, been baptized into Christ. So there are those that have already uh, made a commitment and confessed Christ as their Savior and they have become Christians. But if we are going to lag behind in terms of updating ourselves, what do I mean by updating ourselves? In fact, I, I, I guess we understand what updating means. Because if you have a smartphone, almost every time it's actually telling you that it wants to update the software on it. If it doesn't update its software, it's going to be redundant. The reason why our phones are able to survive time in, time out is because, you know, without your conscience, they are updating themselves because the software has to continuously uh, be updated. I remember uh, uh, when we were coming into the year 2000, I think many of you who were uh, grown up uh, know the, the, the hype that was actually there because so many computers uh, were actually said to be unable to cross into 2000. That was actually called New Millennium. Why? Because their software was not able to read 2000. It only was able to read the 1990s something. So 2000 was actually going to be a problem. In fact, recently, uh, Zesa is actually having an exercise. Perhaps we have actually updated your meter. They are talking about you updating your meter. Because if you don't update that meter, at some point, you are not going to be able to recharge uh, the tokens if you go there and you buy Zesa. Why? Because the software needs to be replenished and updated all the time. And Christians are operating exactly the same way. We are supposed to be updating ourselves with what is happening around God. What I've also discovered over time is that, uh, in fact, there's an English which says, if you don't lose it, you lose it. There are so many things that we have known in the past from the Bible, but many of them we have become useless to us now because we have not used them over time. Many of those things we have even forgotten them. There are so many things that we learn. There are so many things when we are studying that actually come into us and we start practicing them. 
But the moment we stop practicing those things, they actually uh, get out of us. They don't become part of us anymore. And we forget completely about it. So what do I need to do? Even though we have become Christians, we still need to continue making sure that we update the software that is in us. How do we update the software? The software is updated, of course, for free. Because the Bible is the one that is going to replenish it. We know, of course, elsewhere, Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 15, 16, 17 as well. He talks about uh, the Bible which was breathed by God. And he talks about the benefits that we actually get uh, from, the, from, from the Bible. But I like what he says in verse 17 when he says, it equips, it makes the men of God to be completely equipped for every good work that we need. So if we want anything good to come out of us as Christians, we need to be updating ourselves. By updating, I mean we need to be in constant touch, in constant communication with the Holy Spirit through the reading of the Bible. Because as we are reading the Bible, actually God is communicating with us and we are communicating back with him through the Holy Spirit. Somebody recently said to me, uh, if you ever realize that when we are praying, we are actually communicating with God. But when we are reading the Bible, it's not us who is communicating with him, it's him who actually is communicating to us. And that's important for us to understand and to realize that we are supposed to hear what God is saying. How do we hear what he is saying? Most of the time, many of us are good at praying to God. But we are not good at listening to what God is saying. We need to listen to him first. How do we listen to him? By reading the word. When we have read the word, then we know what God is saying. Then we are then going to communicate back to him. He has communicated first, so we have to communicate back. Most of us are very good at always communicating to him. And we don't want to hear what he is saying. That's a problem. And of course, if you are one of those, you are likely to be one of those that are going to be found one day uh, by the devil and he's going to uh, uh, devour you because you are lagging behind. You are lagging uh, behind. You are not up to date with what you are supposed to be up, de up to date with. Who is the second group that is likely to be uh, falling victim? Or, or before I move on to the second group, let me also conclude the first uh, group, those that are lagging behind. Lagging behind can also be seen uh, by you not uh, reading your Bible, that is personal study, of course, at home, but it can also be seen by you, obviously, forsaking uh, uh, their self, willy-nilly, uh, you know, voluntarily forsaking their self. I mean, we, 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 we need to always make sure that when the church is meeting, uh, and I have the, 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 the opportunity to go and replenish myself, I should also be there with everybody. Because when we meet together, like what you said, verse 25, 26 also talks about, we are steering each other when we come together. You cannot steer yourself when you are at home. You need somebody to actually steer you. In the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about edifying each other. When you see me and I see you, we are building each other up. I can't build myself at home or on my own because there are some uh, uh, weaknesses that I will have. But if you are there in my life, uh, you are also going to be able to be there with me. So we need to always update uh, ourselves by attending the assemblies and of course by reading the Bible. But then there's another group of course of those who are going to be affected by the devil uh, is those whose faith is weak. And what do I mean by that? So many times we of course profess to, to, to be faithful to God. And for sure we are. Uh, but our faith is not only shown by talking. In fact I have said this, faith is just like love. Uh, you cannot continue telling somebody that I love you, I love you, but your actions don't show that you really love them. These are uh, uh, action words which are supposed to be shown by action. In fact, that's exactly the acknowledgement that we get in the book of James. James tells us that faith without works is dead. And in fact, he gives us an example of Abraham who was justified by faith. But he goes on to tell us that uh, even the devil has faith because he believes in God. However, he lets work, he lets works. The devil has faith, but he does not have works. We don't want to have faith and also lack works. Because if we do that, then we are as good as the devil, who also believes and he shudders when he sees God, but he actually doesn't have works to show for it. Ours should be having faith, and when we have that faith, which is not weak, then our faith is going to produce works. Then when we do that, we then know that at least we can keep the devil at bay. We are being sober in mind and we are also being watchful. And also those Christians who don't seek God's protection, that we actually find in his way. 
they are also found in the call uh, uh, to the devil. Because the devil would want us to be connected to God. If we are not connected to God, then we are actually falling uh, afoul of God and we are likely to fall a problem. We are likely to have many, many problems from, from the devil. And those not in Christ already are also another group that are vulnerable. Uh, the mere fact that you hesitate to be in Christ, surely there should be some devil that is uh, causing you to do that. I mean, let us understand this, this one thing. There are only two spiritual beings. There are only two spiritual forces that ever exist and that will always exist. There is the spiritual force that is in God and there is the spiritual force that is in Satan. There is no middle ground. There is no other force except in God or in Christ. So either you are in God or you are in Christ. You cannot be in between. If you resist being in God, you should be rest assured that you are in the devil. Because if you are not in God, you are in the devil. It's as good as in this room. Right now we are in here. If we are not in here, we are out. We cannot say, I am half in, half out. Because that does not exist. Either you are outside or you are inside. I am talking about this passionately. Because those that have already become Christians, there are times that we actually relax and we actually don't show uh, our, our commitment to God even though we are Christians. But at least those that have already become Christians and they are in Christ, they are much better because at least they are closer to Christ. What they just need to do is just a small tweak so that they are coming back to Christ. It's unlike those that have not yet come into Christ. I have always wanted to use the example of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. It's a very good example that if all of us are going to follow Cornelius' example, it's going to obviously motivate us to want to run into Christ. Because Cornelius was a very good man. Uh, in fact, when he was a very good man, he, the Bible tells us that he was actually giving to the poor. In fact, the Bible tells us that he was praying all the time. But there's a time when God is going to hear his prayers. By hearing, I mean... God obviously is going to hear anything. If, if you are not praying to him, I think he hears what you say. But hearing is one thing, but listening to it is actually a completely different thing. So Cornelius is going to be praying to God and God hears your prayer. But God is going to send a message to Cornelius and say to him, your prayers have come here as a memorial. But there is something that was lacking in Cornelius. Even though he was a good man, there is something that was definitely lacking in him. And what is it that was lacking in him? He was not in God. Cornelius was a Gentile. We know he was a big soldier. In fact, he was a, 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 a centurion, meaning to say he was heading the Roman soldiers in Palestine at the time. Hundred soldiers were under him. But he was still a good man. But God saw the good heart in him, but still he could not be saved because of the good heart. God wanted Cornelius to be saved because a good heart is not enough for anybody to be saved. A good heart plus going into Christ is going to be enough to be saved. Cornelius is going to be advised. In fact, we are going to see a hungry man, that is Cornelius, who was hungrier for the word of God. But on the other side, we see another hungry man called Peter, who was in, in Joppa at the time. We know he's going to get a vision that was going to tell him to come down quickly and go to Caesarea and meet this other hungry man. And these two hungry men are going to meet. Peter was physically hungry, he wanted something to eat. While he is waiting to get something to eat, a sheet is going to be lowered from heaven, and of course with every kind of animal, and God said to him, kill and eat. Of course, Peter said, how can I kill and eat? There are other animals that are not holy in the sheet. And God said to him, what I have made holy, you should not call unholy. What was he talking about? He was talking about the fact that Cornelius, who was a Gentile, he also is crying for the word of God. You, Peter, go be the medium that's going to bring him to Christ. And of course, we know that Peter is going to go there, and immediately after Peter preached to them, him and his household, that is Cornelius, they are going to be, to be, to be, to be baptized in God. There are several people that are, are going to go to Cornelius and use, try to use the example of Cornelius and say to you, somebody can still be saved without being baptized because Cornelius is saved with the Holy Spirit. But I think they are not reading that passage correctly. Because even though they received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized, Peter is going to ask a question and say, what can stop us from, what can stop these people from being baptized in water? And they went ahead and Cornelius and his household were baptized, even though they had received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not enough to save them. The Holy Spirit that they received was not enough to put them in Christ. What was enough to put them in Christ was to walk through the waters of baptism. And I, I don't know how we can overemphasize that part. This is exactly true. That's what it is. 
And like I'm saying, I am saying there are only two spiritual forces that we can ever uh, rely on as we are living. In fact, somewhere in the book of John, um, Christ continuously said about, the, about, about Satan. He actually said Satan was the father of all lies. In fact, he said he was a murderer and he was a liar. He was not just a liar, but he was the father of all lies. And most of times, the devil lies to us because we still think that we have it. A lot of time uh, ahead of us. We really don't have a lot of time ahead of us because time does not allow us. The safest thing to do for any of us caring to listen to me this morning is to remember that there is only one God and there is only one Satan. If you are not in one God, you are in one Satan. If you are not in one Satan, you should be in one God. You cannot be in between. I am talking about this to all those that are Christians already. So that we are not going to approach God as if we are joking or as if we are, uh, you know, it's, it's a stroll in the park. When we are thinking about God's things, we really need to be serious about it because we need to remain in God. Because once we get out of God, then we are already in the kingdom of Satan. But to those that have not yet tested the kingdom of God, I, I don't know what, what kind of words I can actually craft this morning to try and encourage you to quickly make a decision and be in Christ. Because there are several benefits of being in Christ. Because if you are not in Christ, you run the, the, the risk of being uh, caught by the devil and he is going to, to devour you. We should know how Satan strikes in the same way the lion actually attacks its prey. But I want us to go back to read verse 9. Because verse 9 gives us some, it actually gives us some, some, some reassurance there. Because verse 9 says, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brother throughout the world. It gives us hope. This verse 9 gives us hope in the sense that uh, we are being told that the power was bestowed on us. We actually have the capacity to resist him. If we didn't have the capacity, Peter would not have said you are able to resist Satan. In fact, he knows that we can resist him if we are serious, we can resist him. He has no power over someone who voluntarily keeps himself or herself close uh, to Jesus. Because Jesus is the only way that we can defeat Satan. So we need to be close to him all the time. Because if we move away from Jesus, then we are at the mercy of Satan. We are vulnerable to falling when we are under trials. Of course, every time that you are going through a certain hard patch in your life, you are going through some trial or some tribulation or some temptation, that's the time when you are most vulnerable and you are likely to fall if you are under trials. But what this verse is actually saying is, Temptations will surely come from different directions. They can even come from within the family. They can come from outsiders. But we need to remember that even though temptations are going to come, they should find us sober, they should find us watchful, they should find us vigilant so that we can resist Satan. If in fact in your uh, temptation, we should actually sin. We should not sin. First Corinthians chapter 10 tells us about temptations that are going to come. In fact, the Apostle Paul there says that if we are going to sin after we have been tempted and we go ahead and we sin, we should not blame God. It's you who has failed because your sinful nature in you has allowed you to sin. In verse 18, first one is 10, Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to men. What is he saying? Every temptation that's going to come to you is common to men. In fact, he actually goes on and says, There is no temptation that is too big. For you to bear every temptation that's going to come your way, you must somehow be able to uh, to resist it. So he goes on in verse 13 and says, God is faithful, and you will not let you tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, you will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. If we find a temptation coming into our life, if we find us falling to the temptation, that's not God's business. It's your business, it's my business. We will have failed to, 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 to see the escape route so that we can get out of the, 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 the temptation. Christians can withstand the temptations presented by the devil uh, by exercising faith in God uh, through prayer. Of course, we have been told several times, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is one of the passages. Luke, I think it's Luke chapter 18, also tells us about praying without ceasing. We are always supposed to be to be praying without ceasing. But other than praying, praying, I say, is it's us who are communicating to God. 
but we should also, while we want God to listen to us, we should also listen to him, we should allow him to talk to us. And how will he talk to us? By reading his word. Because the communication of God to you is not going to be brought by a preacher or by somebody else. It's going to be brought to God himself, to you directly, if you open the Bible. I want you to put this in your mind and tell yourself that every moment, every time that you open your Bible, you are communicating to God. But also do it the reverse way. Tell yourself that every moment that you don't uh, open your Bible, you have actually disregarded God. You are not communicating with God. So it doesn't matter how many prayers you are going to offer to God. It's only you. You have been selfish in fact. Because you only want God to listen to you when you actually don't want him to talk to you. Yet we should actually listen to God first before we can actually talk to him. Every time that we are not reading our Bibles, we are disregarding God and we are disregarding his word. And therefore, our faith is always going to remain very weak. Firstly, every Christian should know that he or she is a member of the Christian community, of course, in the world. And this is exactly what Peter is saying here, that when you are suffering, you should definitely know that there are others who are also suffering the same way as you. That's not only, there's no temptation which is only unique to you, there's also somebody who is struggling with the same problem that we are having. But at the end of the day, Peter is saying, we can resist the devil. But how are we going to be able to resist him? We can only resist him if we remain, number one, sober-minded, and number two, if we remain watchful. Satan is always going to be there. Satan is not going to be defeated. We may defeat him now. In fact, the story of Satan tempting Jesus on the, in the Judean wilderness in Luke chapter 4 is interesting to me. After having thrown three temptations to Jesus and he had lost, uh, that verse actually says he went away for a season. In fact, if you go back, if you go back to the Greek word that which is used there, it's kairos, which means going there for a short, going somewhere for a short time. So what that suggests to us is that Satan did not leave Jesus forever. He just went for a, an opportune time when another opportunity avails itself is going to come back and knock again. And that's exactly what he, how he, he operates and how, what, 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 what he's going to do to you and to me. He is going to disappear for a moment, but when he gets another opportunity to come and strike, he is going to come back and strike. Because he doesn't go very far, this verse is suggesting to us that even the lion does not go far. It's always prowling around. Why? Because it's trying to get a good opportunity for it to strike. And Satan is actually looking for that opportunity. Let's remember that if we give him the opportunity and for sure he strikes, he is going to strike very hard. He is going to use a very hard blow to strike. I wouldn't want him to strike me, neither would I want him to strike you. What do I do? What do you do? Let us remain sober-minded. Let us be watchful against the devil all the time. Let us make sure that we always remember uh, to remain in Jesus. If we remain in him, we obviously are going to overcome. Job overcame when he went through these trials. Jesus himself overcame, and of course, he is our protector. We know that he is there for us. We just need to remain in him so that we are not going to be tempted further. 